Hi there folks. So in this video series I'm going to take a look at the long-standing history of freedom and limitations on government in the UK. It's well worth knowing this history and its significance on our modern day politics because it seems as though we're forgetting all about this and why we need freedoms and limitations on the government. The trial of Mark Machen who was arrested and fined £800 for a joke video about his pug being a Nazi has set a precedent that the courts don't need to provide context for which something has been said in order to deem it hate speech. A 19 year old girl has also been sentenced for a hate crime for posting explicit rap lyrics on her Instagram in memorial for her deceased friend. And of course we had journalists and activists who have been arrested and banned from entering the UK under arbitrary hate speech reasons. Hate speech laws here in the UK dictate that there does not need to be evidence of intended hate to deem an action or an event a hate crime. Only that someone, and not even necessarily a witness, perceives something to be a hate crime. And this can even be done post hoc by a police officer. This is tragic in many levels, but among the most important reasons is that we have always been about freedom and limited government in the UK, taking many different practices to the rest of the continent to achieve this. In Daniel Hannan's book Inventing Freedom, he talks about the history of freedom in Britain and the United States and the lengths that we've went to in order to achieve it. As far back as Anglo-Saxon times, we engaged in primogeniture, the practice of leaving the entire estate to the eldest son in the inheritance, as opposed to the more common practice on the continent of dividing the estate equally among the family. This practice meant that the rest of the family had to seek apprenticeships or find work elsewhere, and this in turn allowed social mobility to occur. This meant that people of inherited wealth could lose their status and those who didn't have it could gain it. It wasn't a perfect system, but it was believed to be the origin of a capitalistic or a libertarian society through the idea that freedom brings risk and that the risk of failure drives us to succeed. This seems further cemented by a Pew Research study showing that the UK and the US are more likely to reject state intervention and are more likely to believe that the individual is responsible for their own success. In Britain there has always been a smaller ruling class than on the continent. In some European countries the aristocracy could make up as much as 30% of the population. Counterwise for the British prior to the creation of life peerage there would never be any more than 600 peers in the House of Lords. This then meant that there was more freedom for the lower classes and this in turn improved conditions such as literacy rates which were at 60% for men and 25% for women in Britain by the 1700s whereas in France they only made up a total of 21.3% literacy. This is not to say that there was no class structure in Britain or that life was perfect for the lower classes, just the freedom was better and in many cases improved the conditions of peoples. Richard Huscroft writes in his book The Norman Conquest A New Introduction that following the Norman Conquest during William the Conqueror's reign, slavery was partly abolished. This then paved the way for future laws that would completely abolish slavery, such as the Slavery Trade Felony Act of 1811, the Slavery Abolition Act of 1833 and the creation of the West African Squadron which was set up to stop slave trading ships around the West African coast. The Magna Carta itself was the first rule of law stating that the king is under the command of law just as the rest of the kingdom is and the execution of King Charles I was the first time that the people were said to be in ultimate control of justice as written by the levellers in the agreement of the people. The 1689 English Bill of Rights was a way for the English people to restrict the control of the monarchy and give it to the hands of Parliament, establishing a superior rule of Parliament over the monarchy. And regarding our recent history with the EU, we've always been Eurosceptical. Margaret Thatcher was a great proponent of resisting high taxation from the continent. We also strongly resisted to join in the single currency and the most important feat was the rejection of the ever expanding control and centralising policy of the entire European Union in the Brexit vote. That was where we made it clear that we wanted our sovereignty back and we would surrender it to no one. And so we've always had a tradition of free practice in the UK, so it becomes all the more disturbing to watch us whittle away these freedoms in the name of tolerance. As Wendell Phillips said, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. But we've had to fight hard for our freedoms over the years as well. It wouldn't be the first time that the government has overstepped its bounds. For example, William the Conqueror imposed a massive invasion of privacy by the government in 1086 by recording every single item of property in England in what he called the Doomsday Book. 
It was so called because anyone who tried to hide their property from the king may as well have been trying to hide it from God. Although this collection of books provide a great insight into the holdings of the people at the time and give us a detailed look at the administrative system in place, it was nonetheless a major breach of people's right to private property. Why are you here, sir? <coughs> executing this court warrant. Okay. He hasn't shown me any warrant yet. Okay. I don't need to show you, sir, under the Data Protection Act. You're not Jerry. Okay. No, actually, you cannot. Can I see yeah, the warrant, please? No. Yes, you can. Let me have a look at that warrant. Before. Okay. Uh, sorry, you Thanks. ain't going no, any further. I am coming in there. No, you ain't going any further. I am, sir. You're being very obstructive. Oh, no, you're okay. being obstructive. You're I'm allowed stress. warrant for the address, Officer. and I'm now going to execute this Officer. warrant. Officer, Officer. he has been, <laughs> he's been very intrusive. There's okay. another unit coming now. Now, okay. we really do need to just If you obstruct me, you'll be arrested. Do you understand? So you have a... This gives a power of entry. Yes. Peaceful no, it entry. As soon as that door's open, I'm in. It's, it's not peaceful entry. entry. You're not it being peaceful. peaceful entry. As soon as you open that door, sir, that is peaceful entry. No, you have yes, to be invited is, in. Sir. I think you'll find you're wrong. No. Okay. You, you guys think he does? He does. No, he doesn't. That there's a warrant, okay? It's, that it has to be signed by the courts. Yes, it does. It does it have to be signed by the courts. It's been issued. It's been issued. I'm not giving him permission to to enter this house. The Magna Carta was a struggled negotiation between the rebel barons and the king to re-establish old Anglo-Saxon laws that William the Conqueror had allowed to continue after his reign, such as the Roman practice of using writs like habeas corpus. The easy mistake to make is to think that previous generations whose views resemble ours, they're the progressives, and the ones who were moving in the other direction, they were the reactionaries. But the fascinating thing, if you look at the debates before and up to Magna Carta, is the extent to which the people who were trying to constrain royal power saw themselves as the conservatives. They were looking not forward to our own democratic age, but back to what they imagined to have been the natural constitution of England, one where kings were constrained, where there was a, a conciliar form of government, a parliamentary form through the Witan, and where, above all, the rules were above the rulers. And according to the British Constitution Group, we've had to reconfirm the Magna Carta at least 32 times in our history. For example, when King Edward I reconfirmed the Magna Carta in 1297. So our freedoms have been hard fought for throughout the years. And in the words of Benjamin Franklin, those who would give up essential liberty to purchase little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. And this is what's happened to us in the UK. We have given up our freedoms in the name of tolerance to achieve security and we're losing both. So it's quite possibly time that we once again need to reconfirm the Magna Carta, the Bill of Rights and our old constitutional laws, or as I personally suggest, we add a new constitutional protection, one which replicates the effects of the First and the Fourth Amendment of the US Bill of Rights. The First Amendment reading, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. The Fourth Amendment states, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. If these are implemented correctly and made in an up-to-date manner regarding the internet, this should provide us with the protections for freedom of speech and privacy off and online. So in this first video of the series, I'm going to focus specifically on the Magna Carta, starting with its history. In 1066, the famous Battle of Hastings occurred, whereby William the Conqueror, or sometimes referred to as William the Bastard, first invaded England with his Norman and Breton army. He defeated King Harald Godwinson and began creating his kingdom in England by replacing existing barons with his own men, building great forts and castles and via the aforementioned Doomsday Book. It is said however that William came to overthrow the monarchy, not the law of the land. He believed himself to be the rightful heir after Edward the Confessor and that Harald had actually agreed to this and broken his oath by taking the crown instead. William did impose some of his own laws, but for the most part he just replaced the existing English barons with his own men as opposed to overthrowing the entire system. And this was really important because later on the barons would use the older Anglo-Saxon laws and their permission to continue as a reason to create the Magna Carta. By 1215, 
King John, sometimes referred to as Bad King John, had turned England into a despotically ruled kingdom. John imposed high taxes to support his wars, he created arbitrary and punitive laws, and he even arranged marriages, and so he became very unpopular with the people at the time. King John had also fallen out with the Pope, who then ordered all the church services in England to be shut down. This was very bad for the people at the time due to the strong fear that they would go to hell if they weren't able to attend church, and so the people became all the more angered with John. Pope Innocent III had declared in 1214 that anyone who could overthrow John was entitled to. And following a failed military campaign that year also, the barons had had enough of him and began constructing the Magna Carta. The barons then negotiated with King John over the terms of the law and were mediated by the Archbishop of Canterbury, Stephen Langton. The Magna Carta was finally presented and agreed upon in Runnymede, a neutral spot between Windsor and Staines in June 15, 1215. This document served as a protection for the barons and the church from the rule of the king, but also made it clear that the king too was under the rule of law. Throughout the history of Britain, and even America, this important document has stood as a symbol of freedom from oppressive rule and the basis for liberty and law. However, it's important to note that the Magna Carta was mostly seen as a document to reaffirm laws and old order that had been lost. These included Tractatus de Legibus et Consuete Denibus Regni Angli, the treatise on the laws and customs of the Kingdom of England. This was a treatise created by Ranulf de Glanville around 1187 and is considered a book of authority in English common law. It is a system of legal process for writs such as habeas corpus. The Magna Carta also included Legibus Edwardi Confessoris, the laws of Edward the Confessor. These were a series of laws dating back to the reign of Edward the Confessor between 1042 and 1066, but they were believed only to have been wrote down around 1135 as a way of re-establishing old Anglo-Saxon law that was said to be allowed to continue from the reign of King William. They also wanted to reaffirm the common law, which was established by Alfred the Great who reigned between 871 and 899 AD. The common law was a compilation of laws and customs called the Liber Judicialis that were based on the Ten Commandments. The framework of the common law still exists in England today, and it's actually provided a framework for judicial systems all over the world. They also wanted to repeal some of the outlandish laws created by the Normans, such as the Royal Forest Laws, forbidden hunters from hunting in forests considered royal property. The Magna Carta is then seen by some to be a re-establishment of these existing laws, compiled into one new and more precise body of work. The Magna Carta was originally one unbroken document, but later for convenience it was translated from Latin and divided into 63 clauses. Some of the clauses were removed later due to their lack of relevance, but many still stand firmly on the basis of their principle. I'm going to read through some of the clauses of the original Magna Carta to illustrate some of its original principles. First, that we have granted to God, and by this present charter have confirmed for us and our heirs in perpetuity, that the English church shall be free, and shall have its rights undiminished and its liberties unimpaired. That we wish this so to be observed, appears from the fact of our own free will, before the outbreak of the present dispute between us and our barons, we granted and confirmed by charter the freedom of the church's elections, a right reckoned to be of the greatest necessity and importance to it, and caused this to be confirmed by Pope Innocent III. This freedom we shall observe ourselves, and desire to be observed in good faith by our heirs in perpetuity. To all free men of our kingdom, we have also granted for us and our heirs forever all the liberties written out below, to have and to keep for them and their heirs of us and our heirs. So we can clearly see, even just from that first statement, that this was intended as some form of constitution. It wasn't just supposed to be a protection for the barons, it was supposed to be a protection for the next generation, and the next generation, and well as they say, in perpetuity. The idea that this would be a long-standing document to survive throughout history. We can also see the beginnings of the separation of powers. The idea that institutions should be free from the rule of the government or at least have a degree of freedom so that they won't be held back in their duties and that they can serve as a limitation of John's powers. Number 8 reads, No widow shall be compelled to marry so long as she wishes to remain without a husband. 
but she must give security that she will not marry without royal consent if she holds her lands of the crown or without the consent of whatever other lord she may hold them of. John used to arrange state-based marriages in order to keep control of certain lands and prevent certain rebellions taking place. He basically wanted to create his own type of social order. So this was made as a way of restricting his ability to do that. But not just that, it also gave women rights, the idea that they can't just be married off without their own consent. 9. Neither we nor our officials will seize any land or rent in payment of a debt, so long as the debtor has movable goods sufficient to discharge the debt. A debtor's sureties shall not be distrained upon, so long as the debtor himself can discharge his debt. If, for lack of means, the debtor is unable to discharge his debt, his sureties will be answerable for it. If they so desire, they may have the debtor's lands and rents, until they have received satisfaction for the debt that they paid for him, unless the debtor can show that he has settled his obligations to them. This basically establishes the idea that you can't just come in and take whatever you see as fit. There's a procedure to be carried out during the debt process. So a ruler like King John can't just come in and take whatever he sees fit for a debt. And this could be strategically done to specifically hamper a given baron. 13. The City of London shall enjoy all its ancient liberties and free customs, both by land and by water. We also will and grant that all other cities, boroughs, towns and ports shall enjoy all their liberties and free customs. This guarantees the right to their own local officials. 20. For a trivial offence, a free man shall be fined only in proportion to the degree of his offence, and for a serious offence, correspondingly, but not so heavily as to deprive him of his livelihood. In the same way, a merchant shall be spared his merchandise and a villain the implements of his husbandry if they fall upon the mercy of a royal court. None of these fines shall be imposed except by the assessment on oath of a reputable man of the neighbourhood. This is essentially preventing overly harsh punishments from occurring for petty crimes, so the idea is you can't just ruin someone's life because of a crime they've committed. 21 reads basically the same thing, only for people of a higher status. Earls and barons shall be fined only by their equals and in proportion to the gravity of their offence. 28. No constable or other royal official shall take corn or other movable goods from any man without immediate payment unless the seller voluntarily offers postponement of this. 30. No sheriff, royal official or other person shall take horses or carts for transport from any free man without his consent. 31. Neither we nor any royal official will take wood for our castle or for any other purpose without consent of the owner. These are all limitations on the powers of royal justices so that they can't abuse the power that they've been given. 38. In future, no official shall place a man on trial upon his own unsupported statement without producing credible witnesses to the truth of it. And again, this is another important limitation on the power of royal justices. The idea that you can't just make up an arbitrary accusation against someone. You need proof before you can bring them to trial. Number 39 is quite possibly the most famous of all. No free man shall be seized or imprisoned or stripped of his rights or possessions or outlawed or exiled or deprived of his standing in any way nor will we proceed with force against him or send others to do so except by the lawful judgment of his equals or by the law of the land. This establishes the right to a fair trial, one conducted by peers and that all judgments must be carried out under the rule of the law. 40. To no one will we sell, to no one deny or delay right or justice. This was extremely important for establishing the idea that justice is not for sale. Each person, regardless of their status, has the right to the same fair trial. 41. All merchants may enter or leave England unharmed and without fear, and may stay or travel within it, by land or water, for purposes of trade, free from all illegal exactions, in accordance with ancient and lawful customs. This, however, does not apply in time of war to merchants from a country that is at war with us. Any such merchants found in our country at the outbreak of war shall be detained without injury to their persons or property until we or our Chief Justice have discovered how our own merchants are being treated in the country at war with us. If our own merchants are safe, they shall be safe too. 48. All evil customs relating to forests and warrens, foresters, warreners, sheriffs and their servants or riverbanks and their wardens are at once to be investigated in every county by twelve sworn knights of the county 
and within 40 days of their inquiry, the evil customs are to be abolished completely and irrevocably. But we, or our Chief Justice if we are not in England, are first to be informed. This was basically trying to repeal the Royal Forest Acts that had prevented hunters from hunting in certain regions that were deemed royal forests. 52. To any man whom we have deprived or dispossessed of lands, castles, liberties or rights without the lawful judgment of his equals, we will at once restore these. In cases of dispute, the matter shall be resolved by the judgment of the 25 barons referred to below in the clause for securing the peace. In cases, however, where a man was deprived or dispossessed of something without lawful judgment of his equals by our father, King Henry, or by our brother, King Richard, and it remains in our hands or is held by others under warranty, we shall have respite for the period commonly allowed to crusaders, unless a lawsuit had been begun, or an inquiry had been made at our order before we took the cross as a crusader. On our return from the crusade, or if we abandon it, we will at once render justice in full. 60. All these customs and liberties that we have granted shall be observed in our kingdom in so far as concerns our own relations with our subjects. Let all men of our kingdom, whether clergy or laymen, observe them similarly in their relations with their own men. Number 61 is sometimes referred to as the security clause. It's basically the creation of a parliament made up of 25 barons that are to keep the powers of the king in check, and it reads... Since we have granted all these things for God, for the better ordering of our kingdom, and to allay the discord that has arisen between us and our barons, and since we desire that they shall be enjoyed in their entirety, with lasting strength forever, we give and grant to the barons the following security. The barons shall elect twenty-five of their number to keep, and cause to be observed with all their might, the peace and liberties granted and confirmed to them by this charter. If we, our Chief Justice, our officials, or any of our servants offend in any respect against any man, or transgress any of the articles of the peace or of this security, and the offence is made known to four of the said twenty-five barons, they shall come to us, or in our absence from the kingdom to the Chief Justice, to declare it and claim immediate redress. If we, or in our absence abroad the Chief Justice, make no redress within forty days, reckoning from the day on which the offence was declared to us or to him, the four barons shall refer the matter to the rest of the twenty-five barons, who may distrain upon and assail us in every way possible, with the support of the whole community of the land, by seizing our castles, lands, possessions, or anything else saving only our own person and those of the Queen and our children, until they have secured such redress as they have determined upon. Having secured the redress, they may then resume their normal obedience to us. 62 reads, We have remitted and pardoned fully to all men any ill will, hurt or grudges that have arisen between us and our subjects, whether clergy or laymen, since the beginning of the dispute. We have in addition remitted fully, and for our own part have also pardoned to all clergy and laymen any offences committed as a result of the said dispute between Easter and the 16th year of our reign and the restoration of peace. And the final clause, number 63, reads, It is accordingly our wish and command that the English church shall be free, and that men in our kingdom shall have and keep all these liberties, rights, and concessions, well and peaceably in their fullness and entirety for them and their heirs, of us and our heirs, in all things and all places forever. Both we and the barons have sworn that all this shall be observed in good faith and without deceit. Witness the above-mentioned people and many others. Given by our hand in the meadow that is called Runnymede, between Windsor and Staines, on the 15th day of June, in the 17th year of our reign. So these clauses demonstrate the amazing proportions of the Magna Carta which serve to limit the monarch and hold them to account. It also serves as a base for rights of the citizens under justice and fairness as they saw it at the time. It was a very ambitious document and you can see just how much it restricts the king's powers. Unfortunately King John never liked it and so he petitioned the Pope and had it annulled. The Pope agreed with King John saying that the King had given up too much of his power and from there the situation between the King and the Barons deteriorated leading to the First Barons War. Despite having been annulled, the Magna Carta has still been used several times throughout the history of Britain as a way of trying to rein in the power of a tyrannical government. For example, Simon de Montfort looked towards Clause 61 to create the first representative parliament in 1265. 
He's considered one of the progenitors of modern parliamentary democracy and it was the Magna Carta that he got this inspiration from. He used this as a way of limiting Henry III's powers during the Second Barons War. Sadly, Simon de Montfort was killed soon after, but it served as an important milestone for democracy in Britain. The Magna Carta was also used during the Glorious Revolution as a base for the English Bill of Rights, and many of the state governments of the 13 colonies used the Magna Carta as a base for their constitution. The legacy and the symbolic importance of the Magna Carta are still in use today. All around the world, governments are using the Magna Carta as a basis for freedom, liberty and protection from government. The last topic I want to take a quick look at is the idea of the Magna Carta as a written constitution. Many people will try to say that we don't have a written constitution here in the UK, but it's sort of a half-truth. We don't have one deliberately written constitution like America does, but we do have written documents such as the Magna Carta which act as a constitution. These documents do, in effect, what a constitution does. That is to say, it's a written code of conduct by which the government must be held to account, and it's clearly written in the Magna Carta that the King and the Council of 25 Barons must uphold the tenets of the Magna Carta as any other constitution would. It's been put by John Bingley of the British Constitution Group that Parliament does indeed recognise the Magna Carta and other documents as legitimate constructs for law. In fact, you can even get in contact with Parliament and they will tell you that they must regard the Magna Carta and other documents when they're creating law. So, uh, I thought we'd better go to Parliament's very own handbook, which is called Erskine May. And this is again a second-hand copy from the 1920s, but it doesn't alter these principles. Um, and uh, it's very interesting because it says that the Act of Settlement affirms that the laws of England are the birthright of the people thereof. Uh, and all the kings and queens who shall ascend the throne of this realm ought to administer the government of the same according to the said laws. And all their officers and ministers ought to serve them respectively according to the same. So here you're seeing quite clearly there's an Act of Parliament that tells ministers that they've got to abide by the law. The succession of the Crown Act, which was an anti-Jacobite act in 1707, declared it high treason for anyone to maintain and affirm by writing, printing or preaching uh, that the kings or queens of this realm, by and with the authority of Parliament, are not able to make laws of and statutes of sufficient force and validity to limit and bind the Crown and the dissent limitation, inheritance, and government thereof. Interesting point, isn't it? Nor was this a modern principle of constitutional law established for the first time by the revolution of 1688. If not admitted in its whole force so far back as the great charter of King John, it has been affirmed by Parliament in very ancient times. So there we have it, that's Parliament's own handbook saying, well, wait a minute, we've got uh, the rule of law here. So the rule of law, is not just do as we say, the rule of law is a principle. It is a principle about how we shall be governed. And that, of course, is vital, because if it's a principle about how we shall be governed, it probably sets out how we can get redress and remedy. Moreover, King Edward I reconfirmed the legitimacy of the Magna Carta in 1297 by embedding it into statute law. In his words, and we have granted to them for us and our heirs that neither we nor our heirs shall procure or do anything whereby the liberties in this charter contained shall be infringed or broken and if anything shall be procured by any person contrary to the premises it shall be had of no force nor effect. This indeed seems to reinforce the idea of the Magna Carta as a constitutional law, the idea that it is to be held above any other law and any law that goes contrary to it is null and void. However, I'm going to speak more later in the series about the idea of a British constitution and more importantly its relevance to the European Union. So thanks everyone for watching and especially thanks to Brit Baza for suggesting this topic. It's really important to look into the history of our freedoms because I'm a big believer in the idea that to know where we are, we need to know where we've been. And history plays a really important role in that. Feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments below and I'll hopefully see you in the next video.